On this episode of This Week in Space, we're looking at a busy space week. The launch of the first private flight to the International Space Station, a traffic jam at the Kennedy Space Center, the farthest star ever spotted, the Mars helicopter goes on, and yes, Russia and the U.S. in space again. Stay with us. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is This Week in Space, episode number five, recorded on April 1st, 2022, Just Regular Folks in Space. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV has everything you need to level up your IT skills while you enjoy the journey. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30 at checkout. And by Blue Land. Sometimes in order to go green, you've got to get blue. Blue Land, that is. Blue Land was founded on the belief that a cleaner planet starts by reducing waste while creating powerful, effective cleaners for your entire home. Get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Space. I'm your hydrazine-fueled host, Rod Pyle, editor-in-chief of Ad Aster Magazine. And I'm here with Tarek Malik, Editor-in-Chief at Space.com. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I, I should say I'm coffee-fueled, so not hydrazine, but uh, I was it's gonna probably ask, just yeah. as toxic. So, <laughs> <laughs> As I make it. So, um, hey, Tarek, have I told you about the book I'm reading? Uh, no. No, Rod, you have not. What book are you reading? It's about anti-gravity. I just can't put it down. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> that was good. So... You always got the here's best jokes, one, Rod. Here's one that's not as good. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm known for it. Well, I'm known for something. What do astronomers do after calculating the time between sunrise and sunset? Uh, I don't know. What What do they do? They, they call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very good. I love uh, it. I love it. We, uh, we're going to have a slightly different episode today because we have a lot of headlines to get through because we had a, an amazingly busy week in space I, and new space. I'm not I, even I sure think, we're going to be able to get to everything. I, I think I think it was exhausting as well as amazing. For, yeah, for, for, we're not even doing everything. it. You know, We're just talking about the people that are doing it. Imagine if you were at the Kennedy Space Center, how exhausted you'd be. And let's, let's right. talk about the Kennedy Space Center, Center. So we have a bit of a... I wouldn't call it a traffic jam, but busy. Uh, you know, for those of us that that paid attention to the shuttle program years and so forth, there was this kind of steady cadence. If there wasn't some reason that the shuttle wasn't flying, there was this kind of steady cadence of launch prep, launch, and and most of the stuff that wasn't shuttle was happening down on the Cape Canaveral side at the other pads, right? That's right. That's right. But you, you were you were proper. lucky you got yeah you, know, you were lucky you got four shuttle launches a year maybe yeah you know. No. So it was kind of quiet, you know, and the rest of the time was spent in the integration building and, and all that kind of stuff. Now it is just head spinning what's going on there. So we've got, uh, and you, you can check me on this, we've got the upcoming launch of the Axiom flight, the first uh, all commercial flight up to the space station, AX-1. That's right, well, on a SpaceX Falcon got, rocket. Right, and then we've got the Crew-4 mission, which is the NASA contracted SpaceX flight up to this crew state up to the space station which will be uh somewhat dependent on the date that the axiom flight launches mm -hmm. uh we've got axiom waiting to make sure they're clear because we've got the sls out on pad 39b which is the other apollo era launch pad and this is a nice problem to have um because it just shows how how really vibrant new space is yeah, you know, so so yeah, to kind of walk everyone through, like I guess spring, <laughs> our spring launch schedule for April, uh, from April one to th to April third is NASA's great big uh, wet dress rehearsal. It's the first fueling test of the uh, the Artemis one moon rocket for that space launch system, uh, and and Axiom one, this this world's first all civilian flight to the uh, International Space Station. Uh, is waiting to launch because it was supposed to launch the same weekend, and uh, and now it's supposed to launch on on April sixth as we're recording this now. So they're watching how that test goes, and then hopefully they get to launch on April sixth. And that's a a ten day mission, and uh, NASA wants to make sure that they get off the ground okay before they launch a new crew to the space station. 
on Crew-4 from that Pad 39A, which that SpaceX uses for its astronaut launches. That's on April 20th now, if everything goes well. Uh, and then even more, uh, another crew, the older crew, Crew-3, will return to Earth from the space station and splash down off the coast of Florida. So they've got kind of a little bit more even beyond those those launches. Uh, and they've had to kind of jiggle and jostle the schedules for all of these things to make sure that they all all line up right. So, uh, and then of course you've got all of the the uncrewed launches going off over at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station uh, at the same time. But you know we're looking at uh, pretty soon a site where we'll have a, a space launch system uh, for Artemis One and a, a, a private uh, Falcon Nine rocket on the pad. Uh, you know, with a crew capsule on top, waiting for its crewed flight at the same time, and that's going to be a sight to see next week. So this would be a really good time to get the memo out to all the cruise lines to not stray in to the proscribed area just off the coast from Pad 39B because it would be very bad if uh, we lost another launch opportunity, according to them. All right, well, next up, we've got the farthest star ever seen. And how cool is that? Because when you're talking about space stories, anything that's the farthest has got to be cool. So the Hubble Space Telescope, which has been flying for over 30 years now, uh, imaged a star that was just shy of 13 billion light years away. And this isn't something you could do by direct line of sight, even though it's a fairly large telescope in orbit. You've got to use gravitational lensing, which in itself could be an episode. That might actually be something we want to think about. Uh, yeah. which is using a galaxy to bend or gravitationally deflect the light coming from this very distant star to magnify it. And this was pure science fiction a few decades ago. This is something that has been a fairly recent development. Now it's very routine. So I guess what's remarkable about this, you know, there are people going to say, well, we've seen other stuff that's that old before. But what we were talking about, in those instances were galaxies. So I wrote a story back in 2015 for the Caltech magazine about the, the furthest galaxy, which got a lot of traction. But this is a, an individual star that was yanked effectively out of the background noise of the galaxy it was in and imaged directly. Um, so this is really, really just an incredible thing. It's a, it, it's a young star. We're seeing it early in its life cycle. It's very large. It's about 50 solar masses. And according to the astronomers, it's probably long dead because a star that large doesn't last terribly long. So we're basically looking back at time at something in the various early part of the evolution of the universe. Yeah, it's 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 amazing that they could spot this. They think it's 50 times the mass of our sun and, and much, much, much brighter, which I guess it would have to be for us to be able to spot it from, uh, from so far away. And one of the interesting points that I, I heard from this uh, from the scientists that, that that made the find was they think it could actually be further away than than the 12.9 billion uh, uh, light years that that they're they're gazing across at this light it's taken 12.9 billion years to get to us uh you know departing the star when the universe was maybe 900 million years old or so and uh because of the expansion of the universe the scientists had said that it could be even mm -hmm. even further at 28 billion light years which again uh i think we were talking before the show rod this boggles my mind <laughs> when you talk about things that are further than the age of the universe that we can't see uh, but because these are of kind the of intergalactic so. rounding errors we're talking about here right yeah yeah and if Ever it's dead already point. then it's just like a hunk of a star you know, cavorting out there, or, 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 out there on its own, and and it's like I was yeah. bright and I was big, and you all missed it. So. <laughs> no, no. Well, but but at least they have an audience, right? That's right. I mean, right. according to Fermi, there ought to be a lot more of us sitting around watching this, but we we may be the only people actively staring at it right now, which is that's actually kind of a depressing thought. But um, so it's called Arendelle. That's not its real name. Its clinical name is is a WHL 0137-LS. That gives so me kind of like, a that's... warm feeling to hear that name. Um, <laughs> that's okay, a good so password, where did Arendelle come from? <laughs> well, so Arendelle was selected as a nickname for the star by the scientists because in it's it's a, an old English word that means the morning star or the dawn star, you know, that, that first light. Uh, and it being the furthest single star that they've ever been able to detect, uh, really kind of warranted that. And the the other side of it, too, is apparently the scientists really like the works of uh, of Tolkien, 
you know, and and uh, and the Lord of the Rings, and there is a a character there, Irindel. Uh, it's spelled a little different, uh, but it uh, it is a half. They are a half elven character who travels around with the jewel known as uh, a Cimmeril that is called the Morning Star. So uh, it's kind of a, a confluence of these two things that I guess these scientists really love. In fact, Michelle Thaler, one of the NASA scientists that we spoke with about this, um, my my colleague Chelsea Go did, uh, showed off her elvish tattoo that that she has uh, because of how much they love. Tolkien and uh, and so um, uh, so yeah so so that's it's a, a bit a bit of a a bit of a a, a fantasy and and real life language uh, working its way into this scientific discovery as well. Okay, you're getting way too uh, worked up about this. You know, it, it's good <laughs> that they don't ask me to name these things because if somebody had said Morning Star, I would have said, oh, let's call it Lucifer. That makes all kinds of sense, but that probably wouldn't have gone over very well. Um, probably not. And, and, you know, just a quick thought on naming and, and ultimately uh, if they are going to formalize a name other than WXYZ, whatever it was you said it was, it's got to go through the IAU, the International uh, Astronautical Union, to formalize that, correct? That's right. So they anything that, that gets a, an official name in space needs that. So if anyone tells you you can name a star, you're not going to be able to name this one. So Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, the International Star Registry is a bunch of BS anyway, because you can't name stars. Only those guys get to do that. And there was an interesting moment, by the way, um, on uh, Mars. So Mars Pathfinder back in 97, the geology team was naming all the rocks after Hanna-Barbera characters like Scooby-Doo and, and so forth, which was great fun. And then somebody in NASA legal, I guess, got a memo and said, hey, this is copyrighted stuff. We can't do that. So shortly after that mission, they started naming them about uh, naming them after interesting geological formations around the world, which was not nearly as much fun as cartoon characters. But uh, at least <laughs> Arendelle's in the public domain, I assume, since it's old English. So we're cool there, right? That's right. And the spelling is different, too. So the Tolkien uh, uh, folks can't come can't come after NASA or or the scientists at all uh, at, around now. So, I think we ought to just name it Big Bad Star. But before <laughs> we do that, let's move on to talking about, and again, we've talked about this a number of times, U.S.-Russia cooperation, but we had sort of a new take on that this week with a conversation with Tom Stafford, who is an astronaut from the Space Age, capital S, capital A. Um, back in the 1960s, he flew in, Gemini, in the Gemini program, he flew again on Apollo 10, and uh, relevant to this story, he flew on the Apollo Soyuz test project, or if you're right. living in the Soviet Union at the time, the Soyuz Apollo test project, which flew in 1975, and they used some leftover Apollo hardware to have the first international mission in space, which at the time was a big deal because we were still squarely in the Cold War, and the Soviet Union and the United States were not getting along very well. Um probably on par with where we are now, except that our nuclear forces were were more actively primed. So this was a, a welcome link up in space. Mission lasted, I think it was nine days. And yep. um, and, and he, he commanded uh, that, the U.S. crew for that mission. Right. Uh, he did. Mm -hmm. And the crew included uh, Vance Brand, who was a Skylab astronaut, and heartwarmingly, Deke Slayton, who was one of the original Mercury 7, who got sidelined because of a heart murmur and was finally cleared to fly for this mission, so he got his chance to go into orbit, which was really cool. But the point here is... Well, and we should point out, since we're mentioning we're mentioning the the, the, the Apollo crew, that it had Russian yeah. cosmonauts, Alexei Leonov, the first person to right. walk in space, who commanded the Soyuz, uh, alongside his crewmate, uh, Valery Kubasov. So, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but... Uh, yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> and um, so Stafford and, and Leonov, thanks for mentioning him, formed a lifelong friendship and so uh, it was thought that he might have a unique perspective on our current debacle, which is uh, we're a little angry with Russia on the ground, but everybody seems to be doing okay in space. So uh, take it away. Well, yeah. So uh, well, again, uh, uh, my uh, my colleague Chelsea Goad spoke with uh, General Stafford uh, at actually at NASA's Kennedy Space Center because he was there for the rollout of the the space launch system, and and you know he really kind of reflected about the relationship between. Uh, the Russian cosmonauts and American astronauts about how this was at the at the at the core um, 
this was this was two two professional space travelers who had a job to do and respected each other enough and and were able to build these these relationships you know he said that they didn't have any ground rules they didn't have any 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 uh uh any instructions yeah, yeah it was just you know you're gonna go up there and you're gonna you're gonna meet each other and uh, you're going to be professional. And, and he said, just really simply, it went, it went great. Um, and you know, there was another astronaut that was, that was at that meeting, uh, with Chelsea and that was, uh, Reed Wiseman. And, uh, and he was talking about how a lot of that, that esprit de corps, uh, with Alexei Leonov, that, that Stafford had, 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 you know, that had led to that lifelong friendship that he saw that when he launched on a Soyuz rocket for the first time to go to the space station, and uh, and Leonov took him aside and said, "Hey, this is this is coming up, um, but this is what you got to expect because it's your first time," and uh, uh, and, and and really kind of you know did a part to to make everyone as comfortable as as possible. So uh, you know it's 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 kind of a snapshot of how even at one of the the most contested times. Um, uh, in in U.S. Russia relations, there was this glimmer of hope, and there there is some of that today because space right now, despite a lot of bluster that we're seeing from Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, seems to be one of the few areas that the cooperation is still going on relatively, uh, relatively un, unscathed, at least on the International Space Station. There's many other uh, projects that have been axed or or, or, or are stalled uh, uh, from different different agencies. Um, and we might talk a little bit more about that too, because you know NASA astronaut just landed on a Russian spacecraft, and that that just goes to show you that um, uh, that the the esprit de corps that was set up with the Apollo Soyuz that Stafford's you know fat laid the foundation for is still alive with the people who are actually flying in space. Yeah, which is sensational. So let's just mention that very quickly. Mark Van de Hey just returned to Earth after getting uh, some backslaps and friendly words from the Russian crew on the station and everything apparently went smooth as silk and bodes well for future cooperation, but it's really up to the government, not to the flyers, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Van de he returned to earth after 355 days in space. Um, and, uh, his cosmonaut, uh, crewmate also, you know, had that, that, that same amount of time and they, they landed on the steps of Kazakhstan, like, uh, a Soyuz spacecraft always do, and everything went really simply. I think the only thing that was off was that it was pretty windy, and so after they landed, the wind blew their parachute and it, and it tipped their 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 capsule over. So they had to wait until the recovery team came to to get them. But um, but before before they left the space station, and you pointed this out, Rod, uh, the Soyuz commander Anton Shkaplerov, uh, who returned uh, who returned home uh, with. Mark Van de Hey and uh, his fellow cosmonaut Pyotr Dubrov, and Pyotr is the one that spent 355 days with Mark in space. He handed control because he was in command of the space station's Expedition 66 at that time. He handed control over to the the new crew, Expedition 67, and had a very kind of poignant speech about how there might be a lot of strife going on on Earth, but he did say up here we are all one crew, um, which is probably about as 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 overt. Uh, of a, a, a peace branch you're going to see from a cosmonaut mm -hmm. right now, uh, in, you know, in a, in a, in a live, um, in a live event like that. And it was, it was very, uh, heartening to see that, that acknowledgement that, that, that they have to work together so that they can all survive and not have too many, uh, issues in space on the, on the station. Uh, and then they came back home and everything was, was perfect. And they, they, they were all in good health. They pulled them out of the, the, um, the capsule for their their standard photo, nothing was different. Their photo session, nothing was different, and uh, and Van de Hey was all smiles and his sunglasses. It was uh, apparently a, a nice a nice day in Kazakhstan. And shortly after that, he he flew to a local uh, a nearby airport, their first stop where they go their parted ways. And NASA jet flew him back to Houston, and now he's home uh, and can uh, spend the next few months recovering from nearly a year in space. And I, I didn't see the image of the uh, landing, but I assumed the cosmonauts were still in there embarrassing the colored flight suits. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 it is their their college, uh, their, 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 their university colors is what they're yeah. saying. So Sure. Um, okay. Uh, so our last story, and I'm going to mix my metaphors here, is Ingenuity Perseveres. The Ingenuity Mars helicopter has finished its 23rd flight, and... Uh, this is amazing for a machine that was, they, they hoped it would do five, as we've talked mm -hmm. about before. 
So this was 130 seconds, um, just under 1,200 horizontal feet and about 33 feet high, which when you're a little four-pound helicopter on Mars, it may not seem like a lot to a drone flyer on Earth, but on Mars, where there's darn near no air, that's pretty good. And um, it's it's continuing to map a route ahead for perseverance across the Yezero uh, crater river delta, which is some rough territory. So it's turning out, it, it's morphed from this quick, we just hope it works, engineering demonstration project to actually having utility for helping the rover avoid some of the pitfalls that uh, that rovers face, such as sand traps, gaps between rocks, drop-offs, things like that. So while it wasn't absolutely critical for mission success, it's turned out to be a, a real gift and has spawned plans for a larger science uh, helicopter called the Mars Science Helicopter, which at least in this conversation that they're having now, which is very early on, would be a, a possibly a six rotor design, carry a lot more instrumentation, weigh many times what Ingenuity does, obviously, but could fly much further into really difficult terrain and even perhaps into caves and under crevices and so forth, which rovers have a hard time approaching, or if they can, it's risky. And uh, with the proper that instrumentation, would, it could land to do surface science, which would be amazing. That, that would be really scary to have your solar-powered drone flying into a cave when you yeah. know that you have to get out so that they can survive. But you were right. You know, their ingenuity was an experiment. And, and we, I know we've talked about ingenuity before and how the, the helicopter almost never even made it onto the, onto the rover. And, uh, and yet... Uh, after that that first month of experiments, they were they were thinking they would be you know five and done, and then they would move on for the science phase. And now it has this active role as a scout for perseverance. Uh, you mentioned mapping out the terrain and, and and checking it out to look for obstacles. Mm -hmm. They could also check out potential science targets and and find out. No, hey, maybe that's not a great place to go. We'll go pick a different place. Um, and they've they've flown over fifteen thousand two hundred feet. Uh, for for nearly an hour, about, about uh, before the the last two flights, they were at about forty minutes, uh, and um, and the the solar arrays for this little this little chopper is right underneath the rovers, so they can at least get some some cleaning on that on that array just from spinning the rovers and, and moving around as much more so than the rotors you mean? Uh, the, the, yeah the rotors the, yeah, I said yeah. rovers <laughs> I got rovers on the brain no so um so there's there's a there it seems like there's a case for longevity for this design that has surprised everyone least of all the the uh, the scientists who seem like they, they seem to think that it was all going to be okay and, and it they seem to to have borne out right now all right. Well, that's very good. We're going to re-enter in just a few minutes after a message from our sponsor, IT Pro TV. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by IT Pro TV. You know, the world of IT is colossal and always changing. So where do you start to get the updated certs and training you need? Whether you're a seasoned IT professional or just getting started, IT Pro TV is the online learning IT education platform you need to advance your skills in IT. IT Pro TV has seven studios and they film Monday through Friday. They have the most up to date content with every vendor and skill that you need to advance your IT career. Their courses go from that studio to their course library in 24 hours and are divided into 20 to 30 minute episodes for easy binging. They make sure you're prepared for your exams with their virtual labs and practice tests. The best part about IT Pro TV is that you can learn and get certified on your own schedule, and it's always entertaining to watch. And April is Linux month at IT Pro TV. Check out the webinar with Don Pizzette and Daniel Lowry on April 7th, focused on choosing the right Linux distro in 2022. And IT Pro TV's Linux free weekend is scheduled for April 23rd and 24th. You don't want to miss it. IT Pro TV has over 138 hours of Linux training available. Here are a couple of courses you might want to check out. Linux shell scripting basics. LPIC2, Linux Engineer, or Linux Command Line, plus many, many more. And don't forget about your IT team. Check out an IT Pro TV business plan for your team today. Visit itpro.tv slash twit for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code twit30. That's itpro.tv slash twit and use code twit30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, 
build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. And we're back with our main story, which I like to call just regular folks in space, the flight of Axiom Space's AX-1. So as mentioned earlier, up at the top, this is the first launch of an all-private crew to the International Space Station aboard the Falcon 9 Crew Dagon combo. Um, was scheduled to leave on March 30th from 39A, but that's slid by a number of days, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's moved a bit because of, of of extra tests, of extra training, and also because of the Artemis mission. And they were really linked. Mm -hmm. we, we talked earlier about this traffic jam, and they can't fly until NASA's done with this, this wet dress rehearsal of, of the space launch system. So they're expecting that's going to be done by April 3rd. That would set them up for April 6th, uh, I think about a, a midday launch which would be not a good watching. You could watch it around lunchtime. And uh, right. uh, and then they'll, they'll be in space for, for 10 days, eight days on the International Space Station. Uh, and and the, it's the first for Axiom, who wants to build private space stations to fly more of these missions uh, and wants to build a business case for, not just for these millionaire space tourists, but for everyone, for scientists and whatnot too. Um, and so it is kind of a watershed moment. We've seen a lot of those in the last year uh, or so. Oh, haven't we? Where, yeah, where we had uh, we had Virgin Galactic and their first flights, a crewed flight, uh, Blue Origin and their first crewed flight. Then SpaceX launched the first all civilian flight to orbit, which was Inspiration One. Did not go to the space station. Inspiration Four. Uh, Inspiration Four. Did I say Inspiration One? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Inspiration Four because the there were four people. It was the first flight, so it, it makes some sense. It, so this exactly. launch window, uh, or they have windows on the sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. But they've also got the uh, next uh, commercial launch for ISS Crew Four waiting behind them. So it's going to be interesting to sort of see how they how they unpack all this. So you and I were just watching a press conference with the crew uh, of of this mission and a couple of principals from Axiom Space. So this mission is going to be c commanded by a former NASA astronaut named Michael Lopez Alegria or MLA, as he is often called, who is an acquaintance of both of ours, I think. And he's a record holder for a few things. One one of the most prominent is uh, the number of spacewalks that he did and the total number of hours that he spent in a spacesuit, which if you've ever had a chance to chat with him about it, he has some great stories about being in a pressure suit for hours and hours and hours outside the space station. What I like best about him is he's only a couple of years younger than me, and it's nice to see... And I'm saying this is a boomer, I admit. It's nice to see some people up there that kind of look like they're my age. Because back in the day, <laughs> when you saw astronauts, you know, they were 36, 38 years old. Lately, some have been older, some have been younger. But we're starting to see, which was kind of why I called it just regular people in space, we're starting to see people that look more representative of the general population going on these missions. So there's him. There's the paying passengers, as far as we know, Larry Connor, who's a real estate magnet and jet pilot. Which, you know, it's you're not just an average guy if you're a jet pilot. And he's got a, a ton <laughs> of other qualifications, including being insanely wealthy. Um, Mark Pathy, who's an investor in innovative companies via uh, uh, an outfit he has called Marvic. I think that's how it's pronounced. And Etienne Stibb, who's the founding partner of Vital Capital, which invests in underserved nations and markets and is also a former Israeli uh, defense pilot. So... You know, again, not not just a regular guy walking down the street, but they're not professional astronauts. They did make a point in the press conference of saying that there's a difference between space tourists and professional astronauts, and they considered themselves to be professional astronauts. They're not just joyriding. They're going to be doing a ton of science experiments up there. I think between all of them, he said almost 100 hours. 100 of, hours, uh, 25 yeah, twenty-five different experiment programs that they've got uh, set up. Yeah. Um, so they're they're going to be doing some actual work. They're studying uh, how the the human body adapts to space flight. They're studying uh, uh, new ways. In fact, Mike Lade mentioned that 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 he's looking forward to using this experiment that that where they've got a a bunch of different uh, uh, kind of geometric shapes, and then they just let them right. float off on their own, and they'll 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 gravitate and like attach to each other on their own, and they're gonna test that kind of approach to future construction in space. Uh, so kind of a, a wide one, there's another one where they, they've got this crazy looking helmet that will map how their brain adapts and changes to um, 
to space flight and, and it's called brain dot space is the, the the israeli startup <laughs> that that built this i know right um and and it, it really it looks like a like a cross between like a, a motocross helmet and something you might wear in a sparring match got all these bumps around it and um the ceo of brain space said that they they, they they liken it to like a gps system for your brain so you can see where all the pathways are and how they change over time uh, and they hope this will be a good tool to see how the human brain uh, adapts to space flight over uh, uh, near and, and, and long term um, uh, uh, periods because you know the human body changes in many different ways when you're in space you lose bone mass you lose muscle mass uh, your your eyes change uh, your your uh, immunity changes all of that um, but everything runs on the brain and you want to make sure that's okay. Uh, and this is an experiment that's going to start uh, looking at that. So, uh, so they've got a lot to do, but they also have a lot to enjoy. Uh, they've got, uh, um, a celebrity chef that's cooking them some, some gourmet, uh, Spanish meals, uh, to, to go to space and, um, uh, and, uh, uh and they're, they're going to be able to look out the window, uh, and, and just enjoy themselves while they're up there too for, for 10 days. So, yeah, there's a bunch of research they're doing. Um, one of the crew members is aligned with a couple of hospitals that they're taking some experiments for. I think they're doing an experiment, aren't they, on uh, the deformation of the eye? Is that on this mission? Uh, it's, it's very possible. There's, they, they have a full, a full load of, of, of yeah. science that they're, that they're doing. Um, they've got some, uh, some air filter science that they're doing. These, we mentioned the, the self-assembling uh, 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 hardware. Um, so the, the biology is a, a, a main focus for, for these experiments too. So this is in, on so many levels, an amazing achievement. So we've got the tourist flights going up or professional astronaut flights, whatever you want to call them. And then we've got Axiom Space building these modules, these private modules, which are funded in cooperative agreements, but they've got one going up, I think in the next 18 months. And then by mid-decade, they, they plan to have three, and these are going to dock to the space station, but ultimately the idea is these would, would be undocked when it's time to decommission the space station and make the core of a private a private space station, which would be able to do research and in biomedical issues and uh, orbital manufacturing and anywhere where they think they can make a profit of stuff on, on things that you can only do in orbit, like... Uh, there's certain fiber optics called z bland that are ultra pure and much more efficient than what we make on earth that you can only do in zero g and, and a number of other things so you know it's really the beginning of something exciting and you know we've been watching this new space area grow quickly over the last 15 years more or less maybe a little less but you know if you think back to the late 80s and the 90s when people were raising millions and millions of dollars for these companies most of whom didn't make it Things weren't moving very quickly, and as we alluded to earlier, the progress that we're seeing is just astonishing. And, and I think I think you can even say the same for the early two thousands. I mean, because you you had yeah. how many different companies uh, even then? I mean, you, we, that was we saw the rise of SpaceX and Blue Origin, who who also launched a space tourist flight. Uh, uh, this you know in in recent days that we we didn't talk about, but it was another milestone for them, um, and and yet you also had all of these space hotels and and, uh, and and private space station ventures, private rocket ventures that that all ended up being vaporware, and it, I admit that um, it, it was hard to believe when Axiom Space first came out that they were going to actually be able to do this. And in the time since, we've seen the first private module be added to the space station. That was the Beam module from Bigelow Aerospace, who sadly did did close up shop. Yeah. But Axiom seems to be much, much more entrenched uh, in both the access to space, which you need if you're going to have a private space station, you need a way to get there, um, and the the partners with NASA and, and, uh, and the ISS to set up the research pipeline that would give you more customers than just the ultra wealthy uh, to um, uh, to feed into the, the, the future there. So they seem to be laying the groundwork and we haven't talked about how much this costs yet uh, with every everyone oh. reportedly on this on this flight uh paying about 55 million or so uh for the passengers at least um and that this is kind of really the first big big test of um nasa's openness for private astronaut flights where they're you know they, they started out charging kind of one different thing about 11 11 000 plus a day per person and, and then they, they've increased that to that was crazy um 
to to what is it now 88,000 to 164,000 per day so yeah uh, I just think it's funny too that of these charges, so there's there's NASA now has a pricing policy of 5.2 million per person to go to space, uh, and then there's uh, there's additional uh, fees. There's 4.8 million permission for integration and, and basic services. This is all from Sp uh, Space News report, by the way, um, and. You know, they their their charge per person was eleven thousand two fifty for per, per person per day for life support. They they bumped that up to eighty eight thousand, uh, or you know, to one sixty four, depending on what they needed for food and stuff. Um, but for for crew supplies, the prices go down as low as forty dollars per person per day, up to fifteen hundred, depending, I guess, on how much you eat or or want to eat. So well, I wish they'd uh, talk to my medical insurance company cuz I haven't seen anything that came out of their billing for less than $500 in years. <laughs> uh, my favorite part by the way of the press conference was that Mark Pathy joked and I'm paraphrasing but he said he was the only one of the four of them that hadn't been alive to see Apollo 11 land in person. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of them kind of shift around a little bit like, yeah, don't don't rub it in, kid. All right. Well, we're going to be back to wrap up just as soon as we hear a word about Blue Land. This episode of This Week in Space is brought to you by Blue Land. Did you know that an estimated 5 billion plastic hand soap and cleaning bottles are thrown away each year? And if that's not bad enough, each bottle can contain more than 90% water. That is a serious lose-lose situation for the planet. To make things worse, plastic has been found in 100% of marine turtles, 59% of whales, 36% of seals, and 40% of seabird species that have been examined. And by 2050, scientists predict that the ocean will contain more plastic by weight than fish. That's remarkable. So we need to start creating a cleaner planet from home. Blue Land's idea is a very simple one, and it's beautiful. You buy the bottle once, you refill it forever. No more plastic waste. The only thing you need to discard is your outdated idea that eco-friendly products are more expensive or less effective. You just fill Blue Land's beautiful Instagrammable bottles with warm water, pop in one of the hand soap or spray cleaner tablets, and within a few minutes, you have powerful cleaning products in the most incredible sense you can imagine, including iris agave, perine lemon, and lavender eucalyptus. From their best-selling clean essentials kit to their hand soap duo, and also plastic-free laundry and dishwasher tablets, Blue Land is something for every inch of your home. And, backed by popular demand, is Blue Land's Toilet Tablet Cleanser. Get it before it sells out again. Blue Land's stunning, high-quality forever bottles start at just $10 when you buy a kit and are meant to be reused forever with money-saving refill tablets that start at just 2 bucks. Try Blue Land today. You'll love it, and the planet will thank you. Right now, you can get 20% off your first order when you go to blueland.com slash space. That's 20% off your first order of any Blue Land products at blueland.com slash space. Blueland.com slash space. All right, so uh, Tariq, before we go, I just wanted to get two updates um, from you. We heard a little bit more about SLS this week. One uh, item was real cost for the space launch system. And this is a new number that I hadn't heard before of 4.2 billion per launch, depending on how you amortize it. Did you see that? Yeah. You know, this, this was, um, there was a, there was a, a, a recent hearing with NASA's, uh, 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 you know, chief, chief budget folks, the inspector general and whatnot. And they, they went over those numbers. Now these were numbers that were in a report last year, uh, and they came back again and, and they, they were a bit more overt because, uh, they were saying that, you know, this, this, this goal of launching for a billion or 2 billion a mission is really not, not a uh, feasible given the complexities and the delays that they've seen. Uh, mm -hmm. And that it, they're really looking at like a four, 4 billion plus per flight, uh, which is not sustainable. That's an expensive rocket that you're not going to be like reusing the bulk of it right. um, for, you know, the, the, the space shuttle missions cost on the average of, you know, a couple billion a piece, but you at least have the orbiter and the, the side boosters left over SLS. You'll just have the booster uh, left over uh, the, the side boosters, the strap ones uh, left over for that. Um, and so, so it is something they're going to have to, to really take a close look at for the missions that they want to fly. Um, and there was uh, also some talk that they may not be able to fly more than once a year, uh, if, if, if that, depending on, on the rate of building, um, and, uh, you know, right now NASA is using a lot of leftover engines and stuff right. from the space shuttle era, uh, soon they're, they're going to need to build 
new things and that's going to raise costs too. So, so well, there, there's, there's a, this is a very expensive rocket. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and there, there are cheaper ones available. Falcon heavy. I mean, they don't do a lot of the things NASA says that the SLS will do to lift things at the same amount of time. Uh, the, the, the size of things to, to, to launch to space. Um, but there are different options that are out there that they could be, be looking at. Well, and that's that's something we'll certainly keep track of. And one of the obvious ones is if Starship does survive as the earliest of the uh, lunar Starship, SpaceX's lunar Starship, as the earliest of the landers, it makes all kinds of sense if that thing ends up getting crew rated to and from Earth to just send people on that. And then, of course, you're sidestepping SLS completely. But that's a bigger conversation and one that Congress is going to have because you and I, unfortunately, don't get to decide these things. Um, yeah. So before we go, tell us where we can learn more about Tarek Malik. Well, uh, you work. know, just really, really quickly. So it is the start of April while we're recording this. And I wanted to, to let everyone know that there's some stuff to look for in the night sky uh, the, the, later this month. Um, because if you get up before dawn, you're going to see Venus, Mars and Saturn for a good part of the of, of the of the month. So uh, so please. Uh, take take a minute to appreciate the night sky this this month because Jupiter, Venus, Mars, and Saturn are all going to be visible early in the morning, about forty five minutes before sunrise, wherever you are, uh, looking southeast. So uh, that, that I just wanted to have a little note for that. But if they want to find me, they can find me at space dot com, um, and um, and uh, and on Twitter at uh, at Tarek Jamalik. And on April thirtieth, I'll be watching a partial solar eclipse webcast. Uh, from um, uh, some remote region of, of the world. I won't be able to be there in person, but I think we should all just take a note to watch the movement of the spheres when that happens. So, And I'll, I'll bet if we wanted to see those early morning items in the sky a little more closely, we could probably find some information about um, telescopes from various manufacturers on the space.com website. Am I correct? That's right. Yeah, we've got we've got lots of great stuff there. So. Best okay, telescopes, so best time to buy. That's all, all the commercial the time. time you get. Okay, that's <laughs> it. So, and if you want to find out more about me, um, you can always email us here. You can send feedback at TWIS at twit.tv. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, we promise to respond and be nice about it. And you can also find information about me on my website, pilebooks.com. That's P-Y-L-E books.com. And about Ad Astra Magazine at, get ready for this because it's pretty clever, at astromagazine.com because that was the best URL I could come up with. New episodes publish every Friday on your favorite podcatcher, so make sure to subscribe and tell your friends. You can also head to our website at twit.tv slash TWIS. See you next time. Listeners of this program get an ad-free version if they're members of Club Twit. $7 a month gives you ad-free versions of all of our shows. Plus, membership in the Club Twit Discord, a great clubhouse for Twit listeners. And finally, the Twit Plus feed with shows like Stacy's Book Club, The Untitled Linux Show, The Giz Fizz, and more. Go to twit.tv slash club twit. And thanks for your support.